It was current as of yesterday, but the information that we're receiving is changing every single day. So please keep that in mind that for some reason you look at my presentation online, and I know you all know, um, a couple of weeks from now, um, the data may not necessarily still be accurate. So as a scientist, I work in disaster preparedness, and I try to get um, individuals, agencies, and communities better prepared for all kinds of disasters. Whether that's um, the tornado that hit Joplin a couple of years ago, floods, hurricanes, um, any natural disaster, but also biological events. And that's actually my specialty. So within disasters, you can have something that does not relate to infectious diseases, like a traditional natural disaster. And then you can have a biological disaster, including bioterrorism, avian influenza, a pandemic, or some emerging infectious pathogens. And I'll talk about that in more detail in a couple minutes. So I realize this is a very unusual career. Um, this is not something that I dreamed about when I was in high school. Um, school counselors never mentioned this. It was never on any of those tests that I took that said, you could go on to do these five things. Infectious disease specialist, studying smallpox, none of that ever came up. When I was in high school, I really wanted to study marine biology. That, that was really my dream. Um, unfortunately, if you put me on a boat, I guarantee I will vomit over the side um, because I, su I suffer from extreme motion sickness. So marine biology was obviously going to be out for me. Then when I was um, a junior in high school, I took an anatomy and physiology class, and that changed my entire life entire life. Um, I absolutely fell in love with the human body and everything that goes right and actually helps us function on a daily basis and all of the myriad of things that could go wrong and how, we, uh, how that affects people's lives. And so I decided I wanted to do something in the medical field. Um, I chose nursing as a field and I really wanted to work in labor and delivery because I decided that I thought it would be really special to be there when new life was brought into the world and I wanted to be part of that. So that was my plan um, when I went to school, when I went to college. Then when I was in college, I had a friend who had a summer internship in the U.S. Public Health Service. And she was, uh, she obtained this wonderful internship opportunity with the Public Health Service. And she was on, um, or she was placed in Indian Health Services, now called Tribal Health. So she got to go to uh, a reservation and she got to help deliver babies. And I thought that would be absolutely fabulous, something that I wanted to do. It was a great learning experience. So I signed up, I volunteered, I was chosen, which was absolutely phenomenal. Um, but unfortunately, at that time, I really needed to work on my research skills a little bit better. They sent me this massive packet of information and they said, choose your top three sites where you would like to be located for your internship. Now there was no, no internet at that time, and so for those of you in high school, this probably has no context for you at all. But there was no way to Google this to figure out exactly where these places were located. What they provided me was a map, and it had the little dots on it, and then on the back of the map there were abbreviations. And I simply assumed, being the naive person that I was, that all of those sites were actually tribal health sites, or at that time Indian Health Services. Um, and it, you can just simply imagine my excitement as a St. Louis girl to find that there was actually an Indian Health Services site in Missouri. Well, it, it turns out that there is not, because there is not actually a Native American reservation anywhere in the state of Missouri, and the site that I chose was not actually tribal health. Uh, what I picked was USMCFP, and never, and when I signed up for it, did not know exactly what that abbreviation meant. But it turns out if I had actually done some research, it was in prison, <laughs> so I volunteered at the young age of 18 to go work at, oh, not just a prison, a maximum security all-male prison. <laughs> um, this became a real joke in my family when I was gone for the summer, and a friend of mine would call my mom and say, I'm sorry, Terry's in prison, but she gets out in August. Um, so this experience obviously changed my life tremendously. Um, all men, no labor and delivery, so my entire career path changed. While I was working at the prison, what the patients with whom I dealt, um, some of them had cancer, some had self-inflicted injuries because they wanted to be in the hospital setting as opposed to the general population. Some had drug-related issues and injuries, but for the most part, most of the patients that I took care of while I was at the prison had HIV AIDS. 
And along with HIV AIDS, because they were immunocompromised and had that very severe infectious disease and their immune system was not working very well, they also developed other infectious diseases such as tuberculosis and other strange pathogens. So for those of you not familiar with HIV AIDS, um, it attacks the immune system and actually the virus takes over your immune system and creates more copies of itself. And it's a very, very um, good virus in that regard. It's very good at um, propagating itself. So it makes people get sick very, very easily. So what I would see in the patient population is that they would develop these very odd infectious diseases. And it became fascinating to me to try to diagnose those patients and try to find treatments um, for it, what was at that time a very severe disease. Now, fast forward to all of these years later, um, HIV is a much more manageable disease. But at that time, um, it had a very high mortality rate and people got very sick very quickly. So we've come a long way in terms of infectious diseases. So my goal was to actually at that point then to work with infectious disease patients, especially those who had HIV AIDS. So I went back to school to get a master's degree to specialize in that. Graduated and there were only two jobs in Missouri, both of which were filled, so I had to find a new career. So at that point I switched and started studying healthcare epidemiology which is essentially the study of infectious diseases related to healthcare. So in other words, let's say there's a football player who blows out his knee on the football field, goes in to have surgery, um, and then a week later ends up with an um, MRSA, methicillin-resistant staph aureus infection, and needs to have another repeat surgery, or worst case scenario, an amputation or something even worse, or die from that infection. And so that was what I studied um, for a number of years was that healthcare epidemiology, again related to infectious diseases, but a different um, career path at that time. And I did that until the year 2000. And then in 2000, a friend of mine called me and said, I'm going to study bioterrorism. Why don't you come join me at SLU? I had never heard of bioterrorism in 2000, but I got tired of the outbreaks that occurred. They always occurred at 5 o'clock on Friday afternoon. So I decided, well, surely bioterrorism is going to be a much more quiet kind of a career than uh, healthcare epidemiology. And I was right for one year. And then, of course, 9-11 hit. And within a few weeks of 9-11, we had the anthrax bioterrorism attack. And my entire career changed once again. So now what I study is bioterrorism. Bioterrorism is the intentional use of a biological agent to inflict harm or death onto a population. Now, there are a number of ways that the terrorists can do that. Um, they can either take a, a pathogen, such as anthrax, they can infect cattle, and the cattle become infected with anthrax. Then we butcher the cattle, we turn it into a hamburger, we go to McDonald's, we eat the hamburger, and then we get GI anthrax, which has about a 90% mortality rate. You can also simply take that pathogen, a different pathogen, and you can spray it onto food. So in 1984, there was a bioterrorism attack in Oregon, in which the terrorists used salmonella and they sprayed it over a food bar. They did that in order to try to sway a local election because if you've ever had salmonella, which is a form of food poisoning, you know you usually can't leave the bathroom, you're very, very ill, you're vomiting, you have severe diarrhea. So that was a very effective bioterrorism attack um, by spraying the salmonella on the food bar. And then the worst case scenario would be to take a biological agent, dry it out, grind it down, turn it into a powder, a weaponized powder, that you could then disseminate through the air using a crop dusting plane like a picture or using some other kind of dissemination device. If you do that, biological agents are completely invisible. You can't see them, you can't smell them, and you can't taste them. So if I sprayed a biological agent on all of you tonight, you wouldn't know until days or weeks later when you started to develop symptoms. And at that point, you would probably go to your doctor or to the ER to get treated, and they would still have a very difficult time telling exactly what disease you had and where that source came from. So bioterrorism um, is a very, what I find, a very interesting field. Of course, in 2001, we had the actual anthrax incident where the terrorists took the, the anthrax spores, put them into um, letters, and mailed them to a couple different places in the United States. This was actually a very small event in terms of what could possibly happen with bioterrorism. We only had 22 cases and five deaths. And I don't mean that to minimize those deaths or 
but only to say that in terms of the possible scope of bioterrorism, it was actually a very, very tiny event. I also study emerging infectious diseases or emerging pathogens. That's either something that's brand new, such as uh, MERS-CoV, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus, which prior to 2012, we did not know actually existed on the planet, so it just popped up out of nowhere, caused a large number of deaths, and still exists on the planet today, although the cases seem to be um, decreasing at this time. It can also be a disease that changes location, and we'll actually talk about how emerging pathogens uh, move from one area to another later on in the presentation. Or it could simply be a disease that's suddenly increasing in an area, and one example in St. Louis is drug-resistant TB. So we always have TB in our communities, and quite often we have drug-resistant TB, meaning um, a form of TB that does not respond to our normal antibiotics. Um, but occasionally we'll have an increase in the number of cases of drug-resistant TB, and then we call it an emerging pathogen. I also study pandemics. A pandemic is simply an outbreak that occurs on two or more continents. So it's essentially just an outbreak that's really big. It's an outbreak on steroids. So you can have a tiny outbreak, like at a local high school, or a local daycare, or a local town, or you can have a very large scale outbreak covering the entire state, or maybe all of the Midwest, or all of the East Coast, what have you. But a pandemic would be if you have lots and lots of cases on more than one continent. So then it really becomes a global issue. So why would terrorists choose to use bioweapons? So just like the little fat antelope in this picture, um, bioweapons are actually very appealing from the terrorist standpoint. They're cheap, they're relatively easy to get. You could go out in the dirt right now and get a, grab a culture or get a sample of dirt, bring it in, and you could probably find anthrax spores in it. So it's not exactly difficult to get a hold of some of these pathogens. Now, some of them are more challenging. You can't just simply walk outside and get a sample of smallpox, for example. <laughs> Thank goodness. Um, but other pathogens are relatively easy to obtain. It only takes a basic degree of microbiology to be able to reproduce many of these agents in a very, very small laboratory. And a very small amount of a biological pathogen can create a lot of illness, death, and fear in a population. And that makes biological agents a very appealing weapon from the terrorist standpoint, of course. So we actually did some modeling just to kind of see what might happen with a biological agent. So working with the National Imaging Mapping Agency, or NEMA, we said, okay, if we wanted to release anthrax in St. Louis, what would happen? So we chose a date in history, a random date in history, which was November 8, 2000. We said we were gonna release it from the tallest point in St. Louis, which is the top of the Bell Building in downtown St. Louis. And we said, we wanna release five grams of anthrax. One gram is about the size of a sweet and low packet to kind of give you some context here. So only about five sweet and low packets, give or take, is about how much anthrax we said that we would release. What the computer did was spit out this plume model for you. And what you can see in the plume model, this plume is entirely yellow. might happen 
because if you look at the former Soviet Union's offensive biological weapons program, their biological bombs were about 30 pounds in size. But we just went with five pounds just to make it a little bit more um, interesting than the five grams, but still not completely overwhelming. So releasing it, same release date, same release point. Now we killed about 62,000 people with five pounds of anthrax. So the point here, again, is just that it doesn't take a lot of biological agent to cause a lot of harm and death if you're doing this intentionally. One of the things that I like most about studying infectious diseases is that they're very deadly diseases, but they're also really interesting from a clinical standpoint. Now, these are not diseases that you want to get. I mean, it's not that we really get a choice, right? It's not like you get to go in and say, oh, I really want um, Ebola or smallpox or influenza. You don't get a choice, although of those, of course, flu would probably be my top choice of those three. But Ebola is a very, very serious deadly disease. It's actually been around since the 70s, although most people had not heard of it prior to 2014 with this particular outbreak that we have going on. Uh, but it has a very, very high mortality rate, somewhere between 75 and 100 percent in prior outbreaks. The current outbreak, the mortality rate is only about 40 to 50 percent, so it's actually better. But still, if you think about that, that's almost half of the people that get Ebola are going to die from it. So again, it's not a very good disease. And if you do survive, you can kind of see from the pictures on the side, um, just not a very pleasant disease to kind of have. Smallpox, likewise, is not a very pleasant disease to develop. Smallpox is similar in some ways to chickenpox, but much, much more severe. Just a little bit of trivia for you, actually, especially for the women in the audience. Smallpox is credited as actually being the source of the reason why makeup was first invented. If you were lucky enough to survive smallpox, and 30% of people who developed smallpox were not lucky enough and they died from it, but if you were one of the 70% who survived smallpox, you usually were very severely scarred because the smallpox pox left very bad scars everywhere on your body. And most of the smallpox, or the majority of the smallpox pox, tended to be on the head and the neck and the arms and the legs. So that includes the head and the neck and the face area. So people who survived smallpox were very, very severely scarred. So it was said to be that uh, Queen Elizabeth I, who wore all the white makeup, that part of the reason why she wore all that makeup was because she had survived smallpox, but she was very severely scarred. There's also been some research done in laboratory settings that show that if a terrorist was to use the smallpox virus against us and they used a very, very large amount, that instead of having the normal smallpox reaction, which is the very disgusting uh, rash that normally would occur, instead of having the very nasty rash, you would skip that step altogether and go straight to a fulminant pneumonitis which essentially means it would be like drowning in your own fluid. Kind of like having a very, very severe pneumonia that you just simply couldn't survive. Now, when they did this with animals in the laboratory setting, it was very effective. We never actually tried it with people, of course, because that would be extremely unethical, and I can't imagine anyone actually signing up for that clinical trial. So we don't actually know what would happen to humans. But if you look at animal models, it does appear that it would be a very, very severe um, disease and much more deadly even than the original version of smallpox. One of the things that fascinates me about infectious diseases is that they travel very, very quickly globally. What I mean by that is that a disease that starts in, let's say, West Africa, and Ebola is a fantastic example of that, can quickly travel around the world. The map on this slide actually shows a picture of SARS, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, that occurred in 2003. The entire SARS outbreak was believed to have started in the Metropole Hotel in Hong Kong with patient A. 
inhaled it from the air, which is really gross when you think about it. Um, just being in another hotel room and inhaling someone else's fecal matter and then becoming um, sick for SARS. So within about two days of the Metropole Hotel, of patient A, Metropole Hotel, SARS traveled around the world. So if he had it on Monday, by Wednesday, these other people who were in the same hotel developed SARS and then traveled home to their home countries, and that's how SARS traveled around the world so very quickly. SARS also, or infectious diseases also travel very, very quickly on a local level. This is actually um, a depiction of what happened with the Ebola outbreak that's currently going on. Everything started with a two-year-old exposed and then carried it on to other individuals. So the grandmother, for instance, um, she became infected by having exposure to the two-year-old. She went back to her home village where she then infected her sister and another individual in that village. All of those individuals died. One of the nurses that was taking care of the two-year-old went back to her village. She started an outbreak of 15 people, all of whom died then went to another village who started another outbreak with five individuals. All of those individuals died. And the midwife did the same thing, went back to her home village, started an outbreak of six people. They all died. And very quickly, you can see how these infectious diseases spread very, very rapidly in the community setting. How did the two-year-old get it? The two-year-old was exposed to, a, they believe, exposed to a fruit bat, because fruit bats are the carriers, or one of the carriers for Ebola. So either the fruit bat um, bit or scratched the two-year-old, or perhaps um, it had a bowel movement and the, the child actually ate fruit that maybe had some fecal matter on it, or stepped the fecal matter and got it on his hands and then put his hands in his mouth. You know, a lot of times with infectious diseases, we don't know the exact source because it's hard to tell exactly when people became exposed. It's one of the interesting things about studying infectious diseases. So the pathogens travel with people. Everywhere that we go, we're carrying our infectious diseases with us. They also travel with animals. The picture on the right is actually a picture from the monkeypox outbreak. Does, does anyone remember the monkeypox outbreak from 2005? Okay. So in the Midwest, um, not in Missouri, but in the Midwest, there was an outbreak of monkeypox associated with prairie dogs. Someone got the great idea that prairie dogs, because they're so adorable, and they really are, they're very soft and they're furry and they're small and they're cute, um, people thought they would make great pets. So they started to sell them at exotic animal fairs. People would buy those prairie dogs, they would take them home, they would pet them or try to pet them, and they would then be bitten and or um, scratched in some way. They became infected with monkeypox and it caused um, a major outbreak. So many, many infectious diseases in humans actually come from animals. It's about 70% of all human infectious diseases are actually zoonotic in nature, meaning they start from animals or they're spread from animals. <coughs> so for instance, if you look at uh, MERS-CoV, MERS-CoV is the, the new coronavirus that popped up in 2012. We don't know exactly how MERS-CoV spreads from animals to humans. And we're not exactly sure that it's animals that spread it to humans, but that's the current assumption. When they did testing, what they found was that if they tested camels, 90% of the camels that they tested actually carried MERS-CoV. Camels do get sick from MERS. So it's believed that humans were actually exposed to MERS from these camels, and also possibly from KFETs. But again, it's sometimes unclear exactly how um, these infectious diseases move from the animals to the humans. But with MERS-CoV, they tested, they had to test hundreds of animals to try to figure out where these infectious diseases actually exist in nature. So they had tested uh, pigs, birds, goats, cows, sheep, water buffalo, and all of those were negative before they finally found it in camels and bats. And probably, I think, one of, to me, was one of the most interesting and yet funny stories about MERS-CoV was this story of a camel herder who owned about nine different camels, and he had um, four of them that were sick. Well, camels um, produce a lot of money, and they're also 
considered not like pets, but very similar to pets, although they also, because they create income for someone who's a camel farmer, they're very important to the camel farmer. He needs to keep them alive, he needs to keep them well. So there was these, this camel farmer had the nine camels, four of whom became sick, so he was trying to help them get better. And the camel had a cold, or what appeared to be a cold, because the camel had first cold beef. Of course, the farmer did not know that. So he was trying to help his camel feel better, and he used Vicks vapor rub, rubbed it inside the nasal cavity of the camel, which to me is just absolutely hilarious. And either it's because he touched the inside of the camel's nasal passages, meaning he touched the mucous membranes and mucus, and then either touched his nose, his eyes, or his mouth. Or maybe the camel actually sneezed on him when he was, you know, right up in the camel's face, and that's how he became exposed to MERS. But the reason why I find this so interesting as an infectious disease specialist is that when we try to talk to people about your risk of exposure to infectious diseases, one of the things, sometimes these weird cases come out and you think, oh, that's something I now need to add in my slides. I now need to tell people, don't stick your finger inside your camel's nostril. Or if you do, make sure that you're wearing a glove. Or make sure that you have a mask on so that you're not inhaling those infectious respiratory particles. And so it's just always something new and interesting when you work with infectious diseases. It's also important to know that the environment can play a role in disease transmission. This is especially true in a hospital setting where if you have a pathogen that can be spread by indirect contact. So many, many infectious diseases are spread by direct contact. So Ebola, for example, you have to have direct contact with someone's infectious bodily fluids in order to be exposed to Ebola. But there are other diseases, like MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, that are actually spread through the environment, through inanimate objects. So if someone had MRSA, and the MRSA was on their hands, and they touched the table, and then someone came up later and touched the table, and then touched their nose, they would become, they could become either a carrier or infected with MRSA in that way. So what we see when, you, when the environment plays a role, it becomes much more difficult to try to contain some of these infectious diseases. A great example for that is the MRSA that is spread um, quite often in school settings by athletes that share equipment. So football players are especially prone to MRSA because they share equipment between individuals and sometimes share razors in addition. And those kinds of activities can increase the risk of the spread of infectious diseases. That's a really good question. Um, many pathogens exist in nature. They either exist all the time in animals, meaning they're endemic, and then it simply moves from that animal into humans. Sometimes it has an environmental source that can exist in the environment outside of animals. Then an animal picks it up and either becomes a carrier or becomes infected and then passes it on to humans. So it, usually it's endemic in the animals. So the animals, there's always a certain number of animals that carry that pathogen. And it's only when that animal interacts with the human or enough animals become infected that it starts spilling into the human population, that it really becomes a problem. There's this interesting interaction between our environment and infectious diseases. So for example, a couple of years ago, we had increased rainfall in the southwest part of the United States, which is usually pretty arid and kind of dry. But because that year they had increased rainfall, there was an increased growth of pinion nuts. Well, pinion nuts are the food source for deer mice. So if you increase the food source for an animal, chances are that population, that animal population is going to grow. And that's what happened. So more pinion nuts, so suddenly we have a lot more deer mice. When you have more deer mice, you have more deer mice species, because the two go hand in hand. And when you had more deer mice species, and the deer mice were in houses and people's homes, then suddenly people were exposed to the deer mice species, and that spread hantavirus to humans. So if you think about it, in this case, Increased rainfall, indirectly or even directly, led to this hantavirus outbreak in humans. There are a lot of other examples of environmental impacts on emerging infectious diseases. So for example, global warming, whether you believe that or not is a different debate, and I'm not that scientist, so we're not going there tonight. But if you have increased temperatures 
and you will suddenly have more mosquitoes. The more mosquitoes that you have, the higher the likelihood of having a mosquito-borne disease outbreak such as dengue. If you cut down trees in an area because you want to urbanize the area and build houses, cutting down the trees will increase the number of mosquito breeding grounds and that can lead to more mosquito spread diseases such as malaria. If you do the opposite and you grow a bunch of trees in an area and reforest the area, more trees means more ticks and ticks carry other infectious diseases that increases your risk for Lyme disease. So every time humans interact with the environment, the animal population and insect population is going to change. And because insects and animals carry infectious diseases, that puts humans at risk. With biological agents, we need to identify them very, very rapidly. Now, in the Gary Larson Farside cartoon on here, it says, Jake saw something that grabbed his attention. If we have a nuclear war, it's going to be really obvious. We're going to see the mushroom cloud. We're going to know something bad is happening. Of course, if you see the mushroom cloud, it, it's too late. There's really not anything that you can do. With biological agents and biological events, it's very different because you can't necessarily see that something is going on. You might just suddenly see a couple of patients that start out sick, and then suddenly there's a huge number of patients who are sick. And many of the infectious diseases are very, very difficult to diagnose because they look very similar early on. So it's sometimes hard to tell that an outbreak is even occurring. Or right now, we're in the middle of flu season. So the St. Louis County Department of Health, or St. Louis City Department of Health, are releasing reports every week that show the number of flu cases. So we know we have all this influenza-like illness in our communities. So if suddenly, let's say somebody went to the Middle East for Hajj, and they made their pilgrimage, and they came back from the Middle East, and they were infected with murders while they were there, if that individual shows up at a local ER with MERS, it's gonna look like the flu. So what do you think a local ER physician is gonna think if somebody shows up and they have something that looks like the flu? Actually, they're probably gonna think Ebola. But okay, so uh, that was probably a bad example because we have the Ebola outbreak going on. Um, but my point is these diseases all look very, very similar and it's hard to tell what they are or that an outbreak is occurring. If we suddenly see a large number of animals that are dying in our communities, that might be one sign that an emerging infectious disease is in our community, and it might mean that we'll soon see human cases of disease. So for example, I talked earlier about how anthrax can also infect cattle. So if we have a large number of cattle that suddenly start dying, then chances are we're gonna have human cases in that same area relatively soon. We see that with West Nile virus all the time. Birds, especially blue jays and crows, die from West Nile virus. Even though it's carried by mosquitoes, the birds become ill and horses become ill from West Nile virus. So if horses and birds start dying, that means that the, there are probably a large number of mosquitoes that are carriers in that same area. And you can predict that there will probably be human cases soon after you see that increase in animal cases. Similarly with plague. People always thought it was the rats that carried the plague. Rats didn't actually carry the plague. It was actually the fleas on the rats that carried the plague. So the rats would have been fine to be around humans. I mean, it's kind of gross, but it would have been fine if they hadn't scratched or bitten the humans. But really, it was also the fleas on the rats that spread plague to humans. So if we suddenly see a bunch of rats dying, well, one, we should rejoice because, yay, rats are gross. Um, but two, we really should start thinking about possibly having a plague outbreak. And plague is one of the top agents predicted to be used as a bioterrorism agent, according to the FBI and the CDC. So as I mentioned before, infectious diseases look very, very similar to each other, especially early on. So almost any infectious disease within the first couple of days of symptoms are going to appear very similar. People are going to have a fever, they're going to be tired, their body's going to ache, they're just not going to feel well, um, they might have headaches, they might feel a little dizzy, they might have upper respiratory symptoms, that's also very common early on. So one way that we, um, or one thing that I do when I'm educating healthcare professionals, and I know that most of you are probably not healthcare professionals, but I show this actual slide. This is an actual slide of clinical data from an infectious disease. So 100% of the people that have this disease will have a fever. 70% will have chills and rigor. 60% will have body aches, 
about 60% will have a cough and a headache, dizziness, sputo, meaning they're coughing and talking up loogies, those kinds of things. And then I asked the healthcare workers, what disease do you think this is? Anybody want to anybody want to hazard a guess? What infectious disease you think this is? It kind of looks like Ebola, and it really looks like the flu. Absolutely. It also looks like pneumonic plague, inhalational anthrax. What was that? It looks like scarlet fever. This is SARS. But the point here is that it's really hard to tell these infectious diseases apart because they look very similar early on. Now, later on in a disease course, you will have a differentiating symptom. So for example, with pneumonic plague, homopsis is very common, meaning that people will start um, coughing up blood. And we don't often see people coughing up blood, except with uh, Ebola. Ebola is like everywhere these days. Um, and pneumonic plague and TB. But by the time somebody is coughing up blood, they're probably not going to survive that disease. So you want to diagnose it much earlier but it's hard to diagnose it earlier because all the diseases look very similar early on. Anthrax, cutaneous anthrax, meaning the skin form of the disease, also appears very, very similar to spider bites. From a clinical standpoint, these two lesions are identical. They both have necrotic areas, the black area, meaning that the skin, that tissue has died, and that's very, very unusual. Most of you have probably had a skin infection at some time in your life. Fell off your bike, skin your knee, maybe it turned pink or green, kind of oozed a little bit. So you've probably had some kind of a skin infection. But I, I assume that most of you have not actually had necrotic tissue, meaning dead tissue, associated with your lesion. So if a clinician actually saw this, they would have to wonder, is this maybe cutaneous anthrax or is this likely a spider bite? In Missouri, it's probably likely a spider bite because we have many more spiders than we have anthrax in Missouri, at least naturally occurring. One way that you can tell these apart because they look identical is to ask the person, does it hurt? Spider bites are extremely painful. Anthrax, cutaneous anthrax, it doesn't hurt at all. It can be huge. If you saw the picture of the guy from 2001 who had the cutaneous anthrax on his neck because he must have had like an open some kind of lesion or scratch or something on his neck, and then the spores landed on it when they became aerosolized in the uh, postal facility. It got massive, and it was all black and necrotic and gross looking, but it didn't hurt at all. So it's important for clinicians to understand how to tell the difference between these diseases because treating anthrax is very, very different from treating a spider bite in terms of how you would treat that patient. We also talk a lot about how to tell the difference between in, uh, something that has a rash, such as chicken pox or smallpox, because they look very, very similar. What do you think this is? This is smallpox. This one's actually kind of a giveaway one because it looks like much, much worse than you normally see with chicken pox. Um, but one of the ways that you can tell chicken pox apart from smallpox is that chicken pox usually, and by usually I mean like almost never, occurs on the palms of the hand or the soles of the feet. But with smallpox, that's very, very common. Now you can't say never. I used to say never. Smallpox never occur, or chickenpox never occurs on the palms of the soles. And then somebody stopped me after a presentation. They said, my cousin's nephew's son, so-and-so, had chickenpox on the bottom of his feet and couldn't walk. So I was wrong. So it can happen, but it's really, really rare. But with smallpox, it's very, very common. It's also just a much more serious kind of a, um, of lesions in terms of, um, what the pox actually look like themselves. They're harder, firmer, larger, more of a crater, and they tend to leave more scars than chicken pox. <laughs> Although chicken pox can also scar if you scratch it, so don't scratch it if you ever have chicken pox. Another ch major challenge with infectious diseases is that we don't necessarily always have a good lab test to tell what it is. If it's a brand new disease, when MERS CoV came out, we didn't have lab tests. It took us a long time to come up with a lab test for Ebola, and we still don't have an Ebola test that's like global. So if you thought you had Ebola and you went to Barnes or Sleep Hospital or, or any of the local hospitals, they can't actually test for Ebola here on site. It has to go to a reference laboratory to be tested. And that makes diagnosis much more challenging. We also often don't have treatment 
And so like Gary Larson, um, you have to sometimes test whether laughter might be the best medicine. Um, because we don't necessarily always have a good treatment or a proven treatment. For many, effect, many emerging infectious diseases, especially those that are viruses, we don't have effective to know treatments that actually work. We often don't have a vaccine that works for that disease as well. And so what we end up doing is providing supportive therapy only. And that makes working with these infectious diseases very, very challenging. Now we do have experimental medications. I assume most of you have heard of ZMAP, which is one of the new medications that they tried with Ebola. Um, and that consisted of humanized monoclonal antibodies. Now we don't actually know if that worked or not. Half the people that got Ebola actually um, recovered completely on their own, even without treatment. So just because the people that we gave it to or half of them actually survived, that doesn't necessarily mean that the medication worked. They might have survived it anyway. So it is very difficult with some of these experimental medications to tell whether or not they're actually efficacious. In addition, when you're working in infectious diseases, and I work much more on the side of uh, helping communities prepare to respond and trying to um, work with the public to convince them of the right interventions in terms of personal protective equipment that they need to use, that they need to follow the right precautions in terms of getting vaccinated for flu every year, and, and those kinds of issues, some of the preventative issues. Um, we have these wonderful medications and vaccines, but we still have to convince people to take them. Now, for emerging infectious diseases, it's less of a job, because if somebody has Ebola, they're willing to take ZMAP and other experimental medications because the disease is so very severe. But what happens is our technology advances, but people tend to stay the same. So one of the biggest challenges of working with infectious diseases is convincing people to do something different. Now, one of the things I like about this cartoon is that the guy's in his little hovercraft and his cup of coffee is sitting on the top of his hovercraft. And this really like strikes home for me because I am a Diet Coke drinker, like a huge Diet Coke drinker. Every morning after my run, I drink Diet Coke. And every, mo I don't have Hardcraft, obviously, which like sucks because I would love to have Hardcraft. But every morning I go out in my garage, I put the Diet Coke on top of the car, put my stuff into the car, get into the car, leave the Diet Coke on top of the car every morning. I have a PhD, I don't know what it's gonna take, but I cannot remember my stupid Diet Coke. And every morning I pull out the garage, the Diet Coke falls on the floor, I can't even tell you how many cans there are. So our technology keeps getting better. People like me, we stay the same. So it's definitely a real challenge in working with infectious diseases. It's convincing people to do something different. So a question that I'm asked very frequently is, should we all be afraid of Ebola? I love the chicken saying, oh no, we're plucked. Um, I am not fearful of Ebola. I'm not fearful, even if we do have another case in the US, and it's very, very likely that we will have another case of Ebola in the US because either it will be imported accidentally or even intentionally because the US government might decide to bring some people who are infected with Ebola to the United States for treatment or the military might bring um, infected individuals back to the US for treatment. So it is very likely from my perspective, don't quote me, but it's likely that we will have more cases of Ebola in the US. That doesn't mean that we should. there should be a lot of fear and panic around this. Um, we can control this disease, we just have to be very careful. Another major part about working with infectious diseases is rumor control. So, God, I love this slide. Um, I love how the shark is yelling bear because it convinces the people, of course, to run into the water. It seems as though 90% of my job during some of these major outbreaks is to talk about what is real in terms of clinical information and what's rumor because the internet spreads a lot of lies and misperceptions or they people will read some of the clinical information and they don't totally understand the science behind it and they misinterpret it. One of my favorite examples was during the anthrax incident there was a lot of fear about people opening up their mail and there was a lot of fear about people getting exposed to anthrax because they weren't exactly sure how the terrorists were going to spread it next. We knew about the letters but we weren't sure if it was being spread through the air or other ways. So I was on a radio um, Common show, and I first started their presentation by talking a little bit about anthrax, and then at the end, people could call in with their questions. So this lady calls in, and she said, Dr. Redmond, I'm really afraid that I have anthrax. And I said, well, tell me why you think you have anthrax. And she said, well, I don't have any symptoms, but 
I've been kissing my llama on the mouth, and I'm convinced that my llama has anthrax, and that now I'm going to get anthrax from kissing my llama. So the first thing I had to do was kind of compose myself, because I was tempted to ask, why are you kissing your pet llama on the mouth? I mean, I don't know, my mom kisses her dog on the mouth, so maybe I shouldn't judge other people, but it seemed a little odd to me. But first I had to say, okay, llamas can't get anthrax, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, kissing a llama on the mouth is not going to give you anthrax because anthrax is not spread by saliva, so that's not a risk. However, there are other infectious diseases that you can get from kissing your llama, so really, you should avoid that behavior at all costs. <laughs> so again, rumor control, very important in infectious diseases. So as I said before, there's always the risk of importation for almost any infectious disease. So it really doesn't matter which part of the world these diseases occur in, people are, we are a global society, and everywhere that we go, we're bringing these things with us. So this is actually the map showing um, the flight maps from West Africa to other parts of the world. Just to give you an illustration of why it would be so easy for someone in West Africa to get on a plane and be infected with Ebola, and maybe not necessarily even know it, because they could be asymptomatic, get on the plane, and then fly to another country, including to the United States, and then develop symptoms once they're in that other country. So there is a risk of importation. However, if we follow precautions correctly, then we have a great chance of decreasing our risk of exposure. This in particular is for healthcare personnel. Anytime you have a bodily fluid, it potentially could be infectious. So the way to think about this is that if it's wet, and it's not yours, don't touch it. <laughs> if it's wet and you're, it's not yours and you have to touch it for some reason, make sure you have a barrier between yourself and the wet thing. If you're a healthcare worker, that means putting on gloves, putting on a mask, putting on a gown, or something to protect yourself from that wet material because that bodily fluid could potentially be infectious. If we did that every time with every potential infectious bodily fluid, there shouldn't be a risk of exposure. But people are human and we do make mistakes, and so that is how we potentially could become exposed. <laughs> One example, during the SARS outbreak, uh, we knew that if we isolated people very quickly after they were symptomatic, we could cut down the risk of secondary transmission. And this is true for almost all communicable diseases. For every 24 hours during the SARS outbreak, that a person who was infected who had symptoms, so for every 24 hours that symptomatic person was not on isolation, there were 10 healthcare workers that got infected with SARS. So what this tells us is that if people had simply been a little more vigilant about isolating somebody very, very quickly once they had symptoms, we could have cut down on a lot of disease transmission. <coughs> We also know that transmission can occur when personal protective equipment either isn't available or we don't use it correctly. So here in this slide with Gary Larson, we've got the guys in the jungle, and he goes, wait a minute, McAllister, you fool, this isn't what I said to bring, because he brought the on instead of the off. <laughs> so it's very important that we have the right personal protective equipment, but we also need to use it correctly. During the SARS outbreak, and it's also assumed during the Ebola outbreak, although this hasn't been proven, that it was the incorrect removal of the PPE that actually caused infection. So during the SARS outbreak, we have much better data than we knew for the Ebola outbreak. During the SARS outbreak, what they thought was happening was that the healthcare personnel were grabbing their respirator, their mask, from the front. They were using their hand, grabbing it, and taking it off. Well, the front of your mask or your respirator is very, very contaminated because the person who's sick is coughing and sneezing on you. So it's covered in microorganisms. So grabbing it with your hand and throwing it away means your hand is now very, very contaminated. If you don't wash your hands or use the alcohol-based foams or gels afterwards, and you then touch your nose or your mouth, you're highly likely to become infected. And they believe that's what happened. What you're supposed to do is remove the mask or the respirator from the straps in the back because that's much less contaminated. It's not very likely that a patient's gonna sneeze or cough on the back of your head because usually the healthcare workers stare the patient in the face, and they're not, they don't have their back to them. So if you grab the mask and the respirator from the back and remove it, much better chance of not getting your hand contaminated. But it's still very important that you would need to perform hand hygiene after you took that mask and respirator off. And they believe that that is also the case with the Ebola outbreak for the, the two nurses who became infected 
with what they think that what happened was the PPE was covering the bodily fluids because people with Ebola bleed a lot and expel other bodily fluids. And they think that in the PPE removal process, they somehow auto-inoculated themselves, meaning they contaminated part of their body and they then touched a mucous membrane somewhere on their body and became infected in that way. Now, I don't say that as a finger pointing. This is not like it's their fault that they got Ebola or their fault that they got SARS. I'm simply explaining how these infections can actually occur because healthcare workers are at risk. Hand hygiene will work if you do it correctly and if you do it every single time. There was a great paper in New England Journal of Medicine about a medical student who um, started an outbreak of MRSA in an MBA hospital because he was not performing hand hygiene. So they actually had him put his hand on the Petri dish. He was linked to the outbreak. We knew that it was it was um, the same organism that he was carrying on his hands was linked to the same organism that the patients that became infected had. So we knew that that particular med student was not washing his hands correctly in between patients. And as soon as he washed his hands, the outbreak went away, and you can see the petri dish was clean. So hand hygiene will work. It's just the problem is that humans only most people only wash their hands about half the time that they're supposed to. And that's true of people in the general public and healthcare workers as well. So if you choose to work in infectious diseases, you are putting yourself at risk from being exposed to infectious diseases. In the case of Ebola, I love it, it's kind of like the exorcist, except it's bloody. When you work in infectious diseases, patients are going to get their bodily fluids on you. It, it just happens. There is no way to avoid it. Now, if you're wearing personal protective equipment, you have a barrier between yourself and their wet stuff, but still, you are being sprayed, coughed on, sneezed on, puked on, bled on. These things happen in healthcare that's natural. So you, you are putting yourself at risk. It's something that you need to think about when you're considering a field or a career in infectious diseases. Now, we do provide infectious disease uh, PPE, whether you're working with animals um, is also another risk. So you can see a picture on the side where they're showing the uh, veterinarians working with an animal and they have their PPE on as well. Because animals, of course, also carry infectious diseases. So if you work with animals, you're also putting yourself at risk. If you choose to be a first responder, you're also potentially putting yourself at risk because first responders are the ones that respond to a field, to the um, potential ground zero. So for instance, the anthrax incident of 2001 First responders were the ones that went to the postal facility to decontaminate the area and potentially might have been exposed to the anthrax spores. So first responders also potentially, we consider them healthcare workers. Um, they do put themselves potentially at risk of infectious diseases. Healthcare staff we know are at risk from infectious diseases in terms of morbidity and mortality. In terms of the Ebola outbreak, as of yesterday, 564 healthcare workers were sick with Ebola and 320 of them had died. So we, again, we do know that this is a major risk if you choose to work in that field. Now we need our healthcare workers to come to work during major outbreaks because if we have a huge outbreak and we have more patients, we need more healthcare personnel to take care of those patients. And we don't want staff to come to work when they're still sick. So even though we need more patient or more healthcare staff, Having them come to work actually makes our outbreaks worse. During the SARS outbreak in Taiwan, there was one infected laundry worker who had very, very mild symptoms of SARS. Very mild. He was running a very low-grade fever. It didn't technically even qualify as a fever. And he had upper respiratory symptoms and he felt a little lousy. However, because there were so many patients that had SARS at that time, everybody was working double shifts, everybody was really kicking in and pitching in and trying to help out with the outbreak. So he agreed to stay on, he worked an entire shift, and during that one shift, he was linked to 137 cases of SARS, all of whom were healthcare workers. So we don't want our sick healthcare workers going to work while they're sick. Now I can guarantee we're in the middle of flu season. If you go to any ER in St. Louis, I would almost bet you $100. I shouldn't say this because it's being recorded. I would almost bet you that you could go into any local ER and you would see somebody who is sick, a healthcare worker who is sick, 
who is still working. It happens all the time. Healthcare workers are altruistic. We, there's a lot of pressure on healthcare workers to go to work while we're ill, um, and we wanna you know, buck up, do the right thing, and help out, but it can't actually contribute to the outbreak. A great example is during the Ebola outbreak, there was a doctor who took care of a woman who was pregnant. He helped her um, deliver her baby. She died of Ebola, the baby died. He became sick from Ebola. Um, he, moved, he moved from Liberia into Lagos, and the doctor, even though he became symptomatic, continued to work. He actually performed two surgeries while he was symptomatic for Ebola. He was linked to more than 60 other cases of Ebola, including his wife and sister, both of whom died. So we see this all the time in healthcare, that healthcare personnel become ill and they continue to work because either they're in denial or they don't realize that they actually have this um, severe emerging infectious disease and they continue to work and actually contribute to the outbreak. During major disasters, especially biological events, we know that we're gonna run out of resources. We're not gonna be able to draw straws like they do in the Gary Larson cartoon, um, which is good because here the guy loses to the dog, which is actually sort of amusing. Uh, but we know that we're gonna run out of resources. We saw this during the H1N1 pandemic, and that pandemic wasn't that bad. The H1N1 pandemic had a mortality rate of less than 1%, which is very similar to seasonal influenza. Still a pandemic, of course. Uh, but not a severe pandemic, but we still ran out of resources. We were out of beds, people couldn't get in to see the doctor because the doctor's offices were so packed, um, the hospitals were full, we ran out of personal protective equipment for people. Um, so this happens very frequently during major disasters. <coughs> and we might not get the supplies that we need. Here the guy is in the desert and he comes across a plane and what does he find? Not bottled water, of course, because that would be way too convenient sweat pants. Um, we saw this with H1N1. Not that they delivered sweat pants during H1N1, not trying to imply that. Um, during H1N1, when the Strategic National Stockpile, which is the CDC-based resource nationwide that provides medication and personal protective equipment to healthcare personnel or to hospitals, they released the SMS and they provided all of these respirators to hospitals across the United States. Many hospitals said they would receive an entire pallet of all one size respirators, so they'd only get size small. <laughs> that won't help a hospital because anyone who wears a medium or a large size respirator can't wear a size small because it's not going to protect them. It's not the right size for them. So we don't necessarily get the supplies that we need or that we want during a disaster, and that becomes um, a real planning issue. We also know that some of our infectious disease threats aren't always contained. They're supposed to be. We have laws and regulations that dictate how we can handle infectious pathogens in laboratory settings, the people who are allowed to work with them and not allowed to work with them. And we have very strict guidelines to try to prevent the spread of infectious diseases outside of laboratory settings and outside of hospitals. However, how many of you heard on the news in July of this year about them finding um, the smallpox at NIH? Okay, so some of you. So smallpox legally, nationwide, or globally, is only allowed to be in two places. One of them is not in a storage closet in the NIH in the back of a freezer um, labeled correctly, but still not supposed to be there. It's supposed to be completely locked down. So we know for a fact that many of these emerging pathogens and some of these very severe infectious diseases aren't completely under our control at all times. We try to keep them under control, but mistakes happen, things, accidents can happen in laboratories, and uh, these infectious agents can get out. If you work in infectious diseases, one thing that we try to do is to test our healthcare personnel and test our hospitals to see if they're really ready to respond to these kinds of events. So one thing that we have done is to take people who are completely well, we moulage them, meaning we put makeup on them, and then we send them into local ERs and see how soon can the physicians and the nurse practitioners diagnose these people correctly? How soon do they put these people in isolation? How soon do they notify the CDC that they think they have somebody who has smallpox? And the answers are actually really surprising, or maybe not surprising if you work in the field. Um, when we moulage people for smallpox, we had our moulage person sit in the ER for 12 hours, not isolated, 
not tested, and they never called the local health department to tell them, hey, we think we have somebody with smallpox. They did not, the smallpox was never on their radar. Same thing with the, me the measles boulage, and measles is actually a relatively common infectious disease. Smallpox, you can almost understand why people might not think it's smallpox, because the only way to have a smallpox um, infected person at this point is if a terrorist inflicted it on us, because it can't occur naturally. But with measles, that occurs naturally all the time because some people choose not to vaccinate their kids. So measles exists in our communities. In fact, there's a major measles outbreak going on in the Midwest right now. So we assume that the physicians and nurse practitioners would be able to quickly identify measles, but that was not the case. So what we know for a fact is that our healthcare personnel are not necessarily always easily able to identify these emerging pathogens and use the proper infection prevention protocols that they need to try to contain the disease. Another thing that's really interesting, one of the main reasons why I love emerging infectious diseases is that there's always something new going on. It's really what we know is just the tip of the iceberg, sort of like in the cartoon on the, on the slide. When we actually do epidemiological studies, we get good, we get really, really good data for that one particular time and that one particular location. But in general, infectious diseases are much more rampant than we actually are able to collect data on. If you look at the CDC data, even related to seasonal influenza, they give a range of the number of cases that occur every year in the thousands. So they're like, well, it's somewhere between 40,000 and 80,000. Now, students, you know, if you put that on an answer on a test, you'd get that wrong. Your teachers would not allow a range of 30,000 for a correct answer, but that's what we have in terms of our data for infectious diseases. We have ranges, we have estimates, and we know that it's not completely accurate. We just do the best job that we can. It's also really interesting that, according to the World Health Organization, there's at least one new emerging infectious disease every single year. So if you ask me now what I think the major threat is, I actually don't think that it's Ebola. I actually think MERS is going to come back to the United States, or I think that influenza is going to mutate again and we're going to have another pandemic. Those are my big fears. Um, but I don't actually know what's going to happen. Six months from now, if you talk to me, we could have another major outbreak of monkeypox or some other brand new disease that the world has never seen before. And that's one of the things that I love most about my job. It's never boring there's always something new. It also means that I'm always reading about this stuff because there's, it's really difficult to keep up with all of the changing information on all of these different emerging pathogens. So that's my summary of my career in infectious diseases and a little bit about infectious diseases globally. And I will now take questions. Okay, well thank you very much for the wonderful presentation.